Okay, so tonight we are talking about how to get a computer to make a decision. Why is a decision important? Um, because that's really how you tell a computer to do something. If, you, if you're playing a game and you hit one key for the player to go to the right and another key for the player to go to the left, how does the computer know to make the player go to the right or the player go to the left? It knows it by the fact that it has made a decision. You've given it input, and based on that input, it has either said go right or go left. And that's what we're going to learn how to do not from a joystick or a game console or anything like that. We're going to learn the basics of how to get a computer to make a decision. And the real, um, the real trick here is that computers are stupid. And I'll say this again in a few minutes because it's on a slide, I think. Um, and people think I'm crazy when I say that. But the truth of the matter is a computer is a binary machine. It has two states, on or off. Anything other than that is just speed. And you can think of it like a light switch. You turn on the light switch, the light is on. You turn off the light switch, the light is off. There's not even a dimmer going on. And we'll understand a little bit more about that as we get in to this lecture and the material. So, Let's talk about a little bit about where we are and where we're going and why this is important. My bread and butter as a programmer is because I know how to get a computer to make a decision. And the majority of the time, I get it to make the right decision. I'm not perfect. Sometimes I don't get it to make the right decision. Um, and it's the first part of writing an algorithm. And it, an algorithm is just computational a computational solution to something, to some problem that someone has posed. And it can be a small computational problem or it can be a big computational problem. And we, when we think about a solution to a computational problem, we can think about the game. And as we begin to talk more about the game, we're going to talk about how to break that up into smaller computational problems that kind of add up to make your game. So decision and branching is what we're doing this week. Looping we are doing next week. They are both forms of decision making and branching. Module 3 is about how do I make a decision. Module 4 is about how do I make a decision repeatedly. Five is functions, which is, goes to the structure of a program. Six is data structures. It's collections. It's how you manage your data. Seven is data storage, which is files. And eight is object-oriented programming, which kind of puts a really nice package around everything. So that's where we're going, and that's how they kind of relate. Up through module six, you're going to have to understand up through module six to get your game to work properly. It has to start this week. If you don't understand branching, it's going to be really hard to understand looping. So speak up. Put your hand up. You know, put something in the chat. If there's something you're not getting, let's work through it tonight so that in the coming weeks you have the foundation you need to be successful in your game and in the rest of the class. Okay, so we got some new keywords and we have a concept called order. So there's a keyword called if, I-F, and it tells Python it's time to make a decision. That's what it does. And in the hierarchy of decisions, because you can group decisions together, it always has to be the first one. Elif is always the second. Um, it can't, well, it may be the second. It comes after if. And it says, we're going to make another decision. It's going to be related to the first one. 
And then the last one is else. And else basically says, if all else fails, do what I tell you to do here. Now, of these three, you only have to have one to make a decision, and that's if. The others are add-ons. ELIF allows you to make a determination um, uh, if the previous decision was false. ELSE just says if all else fails, do this. So, and we'll get into more of the order and what this really means in a few slides. Okay, we also have something called relational operators. So far, we've had operators. We've had plus, we've had minus, we have multiplication. We have all those things. Um, these are not that. These are what they call relational orders, and they determine a relationship between two things. And that relationship will either be a true relationship or a false relationship. For example, the double equal sign says is what's on the left-hand side equivalent to what's on the right-hand side. Now you'll notice I've up on weeks one and week two, I've said a single equal sign. This is why. Because if you have two equal signs together, it means something completely diff, different than if you have one equal sign by itself. A single equal sign is assignment. A double equal sign is equivalence. It's a comparator. And you have not equal to, which is the exclamation point, and an equal. You have less than, less than or equal, greater than or greater than or equal. So those are the relational operators, and they do. They relate something on the left-hand side to something on the right-hand side. You also have Boolean operators. I know we're throwing a lot of new stuff at you. We have and, or, and not. And says, everything must be true for my statement to be true. Or says, only one thing has to be true for my whole statement to be true. And not basically says, it's just the opposite. So not and, or not or. I don't use not with and and or a lot. I prefer to kind of construct my test differently, but it's important to say that it's there. Okay. Um, in modules one and two, we talked about ints, floats, and strings. I said in module one that there's a fourth type, and that's Boolean. This is a Boolean value. There are two possible values for a Boolean, true or false. And by the way, this is the way you use it in Python. It's a capital T, lowercase r-u-e for true, a capital F, lowercase a-l-s-e for false. But these are it. Those are the two outcomes you can have. And every single decision you make in Python will either come out with a value of true or a value of false. There's no in-between. There's no gray area. This is it. And this is why a computer is stupid. True and false are the only options you have. So as a programmer, it's your job to break down the problem to a series, maybe it's just one question or a series of questions that will evaluate properly to a true or a false given whatever data you feed it. Now we're going to talk about scope. And this scope isn't something that they talk about, I think, until Module 5. Um, but I like to talk about scope now because scope is important. Everything we've done so far is what's in what's called the global scope, which means everything is available everywhere. If you have a variable, that variable will be available to use everywhere in your script. But that's not always true. What we're going to do tonight is we're going to introduce something called the local scope. The local scope is code that's defined inside of a class, a functional loop, or some form of branch. That code in the local scope is not available to the global scope. So we're going to have to understand when something is in the local scope and when something is in the global scope so that we understand 
when I can use it. And this is one of the places where I see students get, um, st they start to get confused and frustrated. Unlike some languages, because Python is space delimited, there's not always a clear way of understanding when something should be in the local scope and when it's not. So you have to make sure that your indentation is correct and I'll show you what will happen in PyCharm if your indentation is not correct because you can easily get logic errors. Your program runs but it's not working and it's not working because there's a logic error because something you thought was in the global scope is in the local scope or vice versa. Something is just something you thought should have been in the local scope was not formatted properly so it's in the global scope. So syntax and formatting and scope. So here I have a little bit of Python. I have a variable called user age. I know it's a variable on the left hand side of a single equal sign. The right hand side of a single equal sign is int input. So I'm expecting an integer and I'm expecting somebody on the console to enter an integer. We already know that. We've done that for two weeks. So now I have the new stuff. I have if user underscore age is less than 18. There's a couple things to note here. First, user age has to be defined before I can use it in my if statement. So that's an if statement. Um, the if statement, as with user age, are in the global scope. The if statement itself is. So because user age is in the global scope, I can actually get to it in my if statement because it's in the global scope. Then after user age, I have a Boolean operator, which is just less than 18, which is just a value I've given it, colon. So the syntax here has to be if something, some statement, which in this case is user age less than 18, colon. That colon says I'm done asking the question. It's like us giving it a question mark. Underneath that, we see a print statement. That print statement is in the local scope. How do I know it's in the local scope if I don't have my handy dandy little slide here? It's because it is indented to the right indented under the if statement, one to the right. So it tells me that is inside the local scope of the if statement. And it will only get executed assuming user age is less than or 18. After that print line, I have a, an else. Else says, if not all else fails, do, what's, do whatever is in my local scope. So if the user age is 18 or greater, then we're going to go into the local scope of the else, which is print over 18. So there are two local scopes. There's only ever one global scope, by the way. There are two local scopes, however. There is a print statement under the if and a print statement under the else. They both have to be indented properly. My suggestion when you're indenting is always use the tab key. Don't try and use spaces because you can easily get that off and Python and PyCharm will give you an error saying that your indentation is not proper. Or um, so it's much, much easier if you use the tab key. Uh, I think I said this. So we have if and else. Those are our two new keywords. If says, hey, Python, it's time to make a decision. Else says, yes, we have another decision, kind of. I have a statement that reads, user age is less than 18. You will notice I didn't ask a question because this is really like a true-false question on a test. There's only two answers, so you have to read it as a statement. User age is less than 18 true or false. Don't forget the colon. I have seen colons drive people crazy. Always remember that you have a colon and it is where the question mark would be 
if we were writing it in English. Um, rule, a statement is very variable followed by Boolean operator followed by a variable or value. And what you will hear me say when I'm talking about it is left-hand side and right-hand side. So in this case, user range is on the left-hand side of the less than symbol and 18 is on the right-hand side. So that's how you have to format this and you're going to have to almost dumb down your thinking. And we'll go over some of that when we go over the labs and some of the challenges. And it's only in the local scope if it's indented. Computers aren't smart, neither are programming languages. So I can ask, am I younger than 18? And Python is going to go, what? Because Python doesn't speak any English. It doesn't know what younger than is. I may know that younger than is maybe less than something, but Python doesn't know. It has no concept of that. So we have to figure out how to say, let's say, younger than by using a value and a Boolean operator. So it's a true-false test. What I ask and what Python says. So, and Oh, I think I got this in the wrong order. Sorry. What I ask is, am I less than 18? I have a test variable, and this will be used in the if statement, and it must be defined and assigned before the if. Then I have my if statement, and the test variable contained in user aid, sorry, the test, we will test the value contained in user age against 18. So there are only two possible answers to this, true or false. The way you can read this is user age is less than or equal to 18, true or false. And then I have my local scope, which is going to print 18 or less if I am less than or equal to 18, or otherwise it's going to print over 18. And that's also in the local scope. Print 18 or over will only be executed if the, the when, sorry, I'm trying not to use if all the time here, when the original if statement is true. Print over 18 will only ever be executed when the user age is greater than or equal to 18. So I'm going to stop right here. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. And and uh, so if there is something specific you guys want to cover after I finish the lecture, let me know. Um, when parentheses and brackets and quotes come into play, especially if else. James, you don't have to worry about, well, parentheses will come into play, especially if we are doing really complex um, questions, but I don't think we're going to do that complex of questions in this module or in the rest of the class. But if you have a specific example of that, have it ready for after the lecture is done, and we can talk about it. So I'm going to, uh, what is this one? There we go. Cool. So this is what we were just looking at. And I just want to run through this really quick on purpose because I want to show you what it means by the fact that it's in a local scope or not in a local scope from a running program perspective. So let me do this 3.2.2. Okay. Okie dokie, 3.2.2. Where is it? Uh, 3.2. Which one is this? This is just 3.2.2. Of course, I can't find it, and it's not in order. 2.3, 2.2. Okay. 
So we're going to debug this because we all know the debugger is my favorite. And I'm going to go to frames and variables. Right now there's nothing. Okay. Right now I've put a breakpoint on line 11 and I'm on line 11, but I haven't executed line 11. And what it's doing is it's waiting for me to input something because I haven't done that yet. So I'm going to input 42 and hit the enter key. Now I'm ready to, because of that blue line, I am ready to but have not yet executed line 11. Now user age is 42. So if we read this right, 42 is less than or equal to 18, true or false. That's false, at least in my mathematics. So if I step over, well, excuse me, when I step over this if statement, what's going to happen is it's going to go right to line 15. Let me show you. I, it, didn't, it didn't go to 12. It didn't go to 13. It didn't think about them. It's as if line 12 and 13 don't exist because they don't from an execution standpoint. So I'm going to print over 18 and I'm done. So let's see what happens if I do something else. Let's say I do three. So user age is three. I'm sitting here on this if statement. I'm going to say user age, which is sorry, three is less than or equal to 18, true or false. That's a true statement. So let's see what happens. What happens is I go and I'm going to print 18 or less. And then I put a second line in here just to show that you could have another line. Here, let's go to the console. I printed 18 or less. I'm going to print another line and then I'm done. It doesn't care about line 15, doesn't hit line 14. Line 14 is kind of, well, let's not worry about that. It doesn't hit line 14. It ignores these two lines because this was true. So what we're doing here is we're changing the flow of the program. Modules 1 and Module 2, we just step through and step through and step through and things would happen. Now we have the idea to change the flow, and that's where the kind of the word branching comes in. You are taking, we're, we're at, a, at a place in time in our program, and we've got one of two directions to go. In this case, one of two. So we're going to go one of those two directions, and we determine that by asking a question. So this is a branch. So let's get back to here. So now I'm going to show you this in terms of a flow chart because I think sometimes a visual tool is very helpful. And because I think you also have to do flow charts this week for your assignment. So every flow chart has to have a place to start. So you always put a start bubble. Now I have an input, which is in purple, like we had the last two weeks, user age, equal input and then what that does is that goes to a diamond now these um, when you get to doing flow charts because you will have to do flow charts for your assignment um, the, the the shapes are important a diamond is a decision maker the polygon is input or output so I've gone from my input to a diamond. That diamond has two options, one to the left, one to the right. Left is true, right is false. And by the way, the direction doesn't mean anything. I could have had true to the right and false to the left. doesn't matter. Um, what is in there is the decision that has to be made. Assuming the decision is true, then I print 18 or less. Assuming the decision is not true, I print over 18. And after either one of those is done, I end. And by the way, what an else looks like is what's happening with that false. There's no specific extra question for an else. It's just false. If, any, if this is, everything else is false, then do this. 
So it's a default almost. So let's just walk through this a bit. If I put in age 21, 21 is less than or equal to 18. That's false. I'm going to print over 18. And this is what it looks like to Python. All that other stuff goes away. So if I put in 10, I'm going to enter 10. 10 is less than or equal to 18. That's true. So all that false stuff on the other side goes away. It's as if we didn't see it. Um, and let me go back one more just to look at this done. Um, I'm very literal too. Don't be horrified by the project. Okay, The project isn't about your creativity. The project is about measuring whether or not you have assimilated enough information from this class to create your text-based game. And there are some very, um, there are requirements, and, and those requirements, the most creative you have to be is to be able to say, I have these rooms, and this is how I'm going to get to and from my rooms, and this is what's going to happen in a room. But so don't worry about being horrified by the project. Um, we're giving you the building blocks. And the game is a very simple text-based game. And I hope that helps a little bit. What you see here is a branch. The branch basically is, does just that. It's, I have an option of doing a couple of different things. And this is why it's called branching. That's all I want to say. So another decision maker. We've talked about if and we've talked about else. Well, now we're going to talk about elif. So here's some code. I have a variable called year. Year is my test variable. Okay? Everything else is going to deal with year. So I'm going to input a year, but I have more than two options here. I have a bunch of options. I have if it's in the distant future, if it was in the 21st century, the 20th century, or if it was long, long ago. So everything I'm testing is going to be against year, because that's my test variable. So I have if, elif, elif, and then else. Elif is just another way of testing, but you only get to elif when if is false. You only get to the first one. You only get to the second elif when if is false and the first elif is false. So that's what you just have to remember. This is a sequence and it runs in sequence. So I have if year is greater than 2021, I'm going to print distant future. If year is greater than or equal to 2001, 21st century, greater than or equal to 1901, 20th century, and then print long ago. So it will only get to the statement that if Ellis statement, if the year is less than 2021. It will only get to this statement if the year is less than 2021 and the year is less than 20, 2001. My bad, I'll fix that. And it will only get to here if everything, if, if it is less than 2001 to 30, 2021, 2101. Good God. I don't know what I was thinking when I did that. 2021, 2001, and 1901. And the order matters here. And the order matters because if I put in 1900, Sorry, if, yeah, we'll do it backwards in PyCharm and then I'll show you. I'm not going to explain it well off the top of my head. Okay, so let's look at our middle age flowchart because I want to see if I'm middle aged. Sorry, this isn't middle age. I should have renamed it. Um, so I'm going to input a year. I'm going to say is year greater than 2020, 2101. 
Is year greater than 2001? Is year greater than 1901? And I'm going to ask these questions in a series. And once I've asked the questions in the series, I can say yay, nay, yes or no, sorry, true or false, true or false, true or false, and then finally potentially go to long ago. So this is what just a, a, a slightly more complex flow chart looks like. And that's why we don't continue to do flow charts in the class when we're talking about the labs. We're going to talk about uh, pseudocode in just a few minutes. So if I put in 2200, is 2200 greater than or equal to 2102? That's true. Everything else goes away and I print distant future. Sorry, my innovation is not happy. If I put in 2002, 2002 is not greater than 2102, but it is greater than 2001, so I'm going to print 21st century. And then I come back, I'm going to print 1920. 1920 is not greater than 2102, it's not greater than 2001, but it is greater than 1901. And I print 20th century. Don't know why I did that. I apologize. My animation's crappy on this one. Okay. So we're just going to stop. 1820 will go to the else. My apologize. My animation sucked on that one. Okay. So. Now we get to talk about Boolean operators. Well, actually, let me do this first. Let me go to PyCharm and do an LIF. Okay, so let's just look at this one real quick. This has a bunch of LIF statements. And I'm going to add something here. I'm going to say else. Print How's that? Bucket of rust. So this is just a simple one of the challenges, and it says if the year is 69 or earlier, print few safety features. All right. It's greater than 1970. Actually, I'm going to do this right. I'm going to say. Um, battery operated because we have battery operated cars now. So what this is going to do is we're going to look at each and every one of these and do something depending on what the model year of the car is. And Different things will happen based on what we put in, just like we did before. But this time, there are multiple options. And again, we're using the same test variable. We're using car year. So we're testing car year. Could I have everybody mute, please? We're testing car year against different dates. I don't think that 2000... 1970, 1990. Okay, so this is wrong. I apologize. 1970, 69 or earlier, 70. Oh, I think I put this in the wrong order. Has seatbelts, has airbags. Okay, this is in the wrong order, and it's not going to work right, but it's logic error, and I'll show you why it will be a logic error. So I'm going to debug this because we all know I like the debugger. So I am waiting on the breakpoint on line 14. I haven't executed anything yet because right now it, it executed this line and it's waiting for me to put something in. So first of all, I'm going to put in 1968. Oops, sorry. My bad. Uh, what one's that? There we go. Let 
me do this. Three, three, two. Okay. Three, three, two. There it is. Now I'll execute the right one. So I'm going to put in the year and I'm going to say 1968. So 1968 is less than or equal to 1969. Now the nice thing about PyCharm that you just saw is I moused over this statement and PyCharm is automatically telling me it's true because of what I entered for car year. And it will do that. While you're in the debugger, you can run it over any statement that it's on and it will tell you what the answer is. So this is true. So I'm going to print a few safety features. Now I'm going, why did I do that? 70 or later. Okay. So now I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to make it 1971. So I'm going to debug it and I'm going to put in 1971 and it is not less than or equal to 1969. It is not greater than or equal to 2000. It is not greater than or equal to 1900. It is greater than or equal to 1970 and probably has seat belts is what it's going to print out. Now I want to do something here and it's about the order because what I thought I did was wrong but it's not. So I'm just going to copy this and I'm going to paste it and I'm just doing this so I can preserve the original code so I don't have to rewrite it later. Okay, so now I'm going to change the order because it would seem to me like shouldn't I just be checking 1969, 1970, 1990. Let's see what happens because we just saw that if I put in 1970 it went all the way down to the bottom. Wouldn't it be faster if I put 1970 up at the top? So let's see what happens. So I'm going to do this, I'm going to do, whoops, there we go, and then I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Okay, so 1969 will work, pretty sure. Let's see what happens when I debug this again, oh, let me... Let me start that again. Let me debug it. Okay. I'm here just to make sure things work the way they did before. I'm going to put in 1971 and oh, hit the enter key. So 1971 is not less than or equal to 1969. Year is 1971. So I'm going to say probably seatbelts. So far, so good. Looks like it works. Okay. So now I'm going to put in 2001. So if it's 2001, it should probably all the way, get all the way down to here. And I'll show you why it's not going to do that, and it will be a logic error in just a moment. So let me do this. I'm going to put in 2001. So if I put in 2001, I step over. Whoops. What did I do wrong? Uh, nope. Hold on. Invalid. Enter literal for with base 10. So it thinks I put in something wrong. Let's try it again. I'm going to put in 2001 and hit the enter key. Now we're happy. 
So, 2001 is not less than 1969. 2001 is greater than or equal to 1970. And guess what? It's going to say probably has seat belts. And then it's done. But that's not what it wanted me to do. If it, if it was 2000 or later, it said probably has airbags. What in the world did I do? Well, the only thing I did was change the order of these Ellis statements. So when I'm testing my Ellis statements, I have to have them in the order that they're going to fail. So because I'm saying year greater than or equal, I have to start, except for 1969 because it has a less than or equal, I have to start with the biggest number. So if it's greater than or equal, I need to start with this. So this has to be the next test. And then I have to go to the next biggest number, which is this. Oh, okay. And then I'm okay because it's greater than or equal to. If it were less than or equal to, I wanted the other, I wanted the lower test, um, test values. But because it's greater than, I want the greater test value. So order matters. So I'm going to stop this and run it one more time. And this time, I'm going to put in 2001 again. Hit the Enter key. We know it's not going to hit 1969. Now it says, Elif, car year is greater than 2000. I'm going to step over, probably has airbags, which is the right answer. And we're done. So that's why order matters when you're using ELIF statements. You have to make sure that these will fail in the order you want them to fail. Because if not, it'll be a logic error, and it will probably drive you nuts. Now, let's talk a little bit about scope here. Well, no, we're not going to talk a little bit about scope on this one. I am going to talk about a few other errors, though. These, this right here, is in the local scope of this if. If I do this, it's not in the local scope. If you are in PyCharm and you start seeing things like all these red lines, you look at line, let's say, 16 and say, but the line looks right because it doesn't have anything to do with line 16. If you are on like line 16 and you're really sure line 16 is fine, start looking backwards because the problem could be higher up in your program. In this case, it's just that things weren't tabbed right, but that's what will happen. So let's go back here, Let me try and speed things up a bit. Boolean operators. So we've got relational operators, which we just talked about. We've got Boolean operators. Boolean operators allow you to write complex statements. And you can, I'll tell you what, you can get some pretty complex statements going on um, with just ands and ors. So and this, how Boolean operator works, determines what the outcome of your question is going to be. And if when you have and as a Boolean operator between two statements, and that's how you have to use it, you have to have a statement, an and, and then another statement, full statements. Um, when you have an and in between two statements, it means both statements have to equal true for the entire question to be true. When you have an or in the middle of two statements, any one of those two statements can be true and the entire statement is true. So how strict do you want to be? If you have num1 and num2 and I say, if num1 is equal is equivalent to 10 and num2 is equivalent to 2, then what's going to happen? Well, it's going to evaluate to true because I have an and, and it's true and true is always true. And by the way, there's a whole table in Zybooks that tells you 
what happens when you AND and OR things. If I have a, the next statement under AND is if num1 is equivalent to 10 and num2 is less than 2. Well, num1 is in fact 10, but num2 is 2, so it's not less than 2. So that's going to be a false. So I'll have a true and a false, which means I have false. So it failed the statement. Now, that same one, if I put an or in the middle, would become a true statement because or says either one can be true or false. So, why did I go through that? Well, because you want to deal with the concept of between. Between is one of those concepts that some people find difficult. And when I very, very first tried to do this, I found it a little difficult too. And this is also where that order of your options comes in. So your order has to be right, and you have to understand what's happening. So... If I want to say, is a number between two other numbers, I have to know how to write that in Python. One of the ways I do that is I use the AND. And I use the AND specifically um, with less than or greater than and equal to. So here's what we do. First of all, we have our test variable. In this case, age is our test variable, and it's equal to 20. Now, I want to know, I, I want to say, hey, if age is greater than zero and less than four, they're too young for school. So, is, is age between zero and four? No, it's not. Or actually zero and three because it's a less than. The next question in that sequence of questions is, hey, is age greater than or equal to 4? Well, that's true. 20 is greater than or equal to 4. And is age less than 9? Well, that's false because age is not. 20 is not less than 9. So that one evaluates to false. The next one down is, hey, is age greater than or equal to 9? Yes, 20 is greater than or equal to 9. And is age less than 13? Well, let's see, 20 is not less than 13, so that's false. So I have a true and a false, which is always false. Then I go look and I say, okay, age is 20 still. Is 20 greater than 13? Absolutely, that's a true. Then I have an and, and I have age less than 19. So is 20 less than 19? Nope, that's a false. So that's a true and a false, and that's always going to be false. So in this case, with age 20, I'm going to drop down to the else, and I'm going to print to infinity and beyond. So uh, complex questions. This is kind of a running walkthrough of, one, of something similar to one of the labs. You have two difficult labs this week, two specifically difficult labs. One is the month one, and one is the exact change one. So this is the exact change one. And what we really are doing here is I want to figure out the number of hundreds and the number of tens in some number that I've given it, and then print whether if I have multiple of hundreds, and I want to print hundreds, and if I don't have multiple of hundreds, then I want to print hundred, or I want to print there aren't any. So, in this case, I have a number called 223. Now, Python has something called the floor operator. You're going to need to use that this week. This is the calculation that you have to use for the exact change. Don't deviate. If you try and use modular, it's not going to work right. So I can say hundreds equal to 23 floor 100. What that is going to do is it's going to tell me the number of times that 100 goes into 223 as a whole number, and that's 2. 
Then I'm going to say num equal num minus hundreds times 100. So it's going to be num equals, so 223 minus 200. So it's going to be 23. And then I'm going to do the same for a 10, num modulo 10, which is going to give me 2. And then after that, I want to print some stuff out. So if hundreds is 0, print no hundreds. If hundreds is greater than 1, else print that. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually go and show you the, the script for this guy. That pesky semicolon. Python doesn't have semicolons. It has colons. But Java has semicolons all over the place. So does C and C++. Anyway, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this one. Uh, where's my between? Here's my between. Is that it? No. Floor. That's the one I want. Okay. So this is somewhat similar to um, a problem you might have as a lab. So basically what we have here is I have some amount of money and I want to know how many times, how many whole times 100 goes into it and how many whole times 25 goes into it. And I'm going to say I have dollars equal money mod or sorry money floor 100 and then I'm going to print that and then I'm going to say the amount of money that I have left is money minus dollars times 100 and then I'm going to print the amount and then I'm going to figure out how many times the quarters goes into that amount and then I'm going to print it and here's where all the if comes in because you're going to have a nested if statement so if dollars is greater than zero I'm going to print dollars, which is my test variable, comma, end and a space, and then I want to print either dollar or dollars, depending on if there's a single dollar, or if there's more than a single dollar, print dollars, and the same with quarters. And by the way, you can nest if statements. You can nest elif statements. You can nest as, ma uh, as many times as you like. Um, if you're starting to get into three and four nests, I'd look at your data structures, or four and five nests, I'd look at your data structures. So let's run through this really quick. And by the way, I didn't use an input because I just didn't want to mess with it. But we can change this number and play around with it if you want. So let me edit the configuration, go to floor, and I promise we won't run over too, too late. Floor. And I'm going to debug because we already know that I like debugging. So I'm going to go to variables. So first my variables are going to get defined. So now I'm going to calculate the number of dollars. So I'm going to say dollars floor 100. Money floor 100 is going to be dollars. And my dollars is 11 because I was at 11.42. And then I'm just going to print out dollars for the heck of it. Now I'm going to do amount, and it's going to be money minus dollars times 100. That's 42. Um, so I'm going to print out 42 just for the heck of it. Now I'm going to print out the number of quarters in 42. So I'm going to do that. There's one quarter in 42. I'm going to print out quarters. So now here's where the if statement comes in. First of all, is dollars greater than zero? Dollars is 11. 11 is greater than zero, so dollars is greater than zero. So I will come into the local scope of that if statement. I'm going to print the number of dollars. Let's go look at the console. I'm printing the number of dollars, which is 11. Now I want to know what word do I put after that? Do I put the word dollar after it, because there's only one? or dollars because there's more than one. And I already know there's more than zero because I wouldn't have gotten here if we hadn't already checked for zero. Since dollars is 11, 11 is not equal to one. So I'm going to go immediately down to the if statement and I'm going to print dollars. So I have $11. So now I'm going to test quarters. I have quarters greater than zero. Well. 
quarters is 1, so 1 is greater than 0. I'm going to print the number of quarters. And notice here I'm using this in the print statement. So I'm not allowing it to make a new line. I'm telling it to put a space only and not a new line. So quarters is 1. So 1 is the same as 1. It's equivalent to 1. So I'm going to output quarter, and I'm going to be done. So that is very similar to the beginnings of a lab that you have this week. So that we did. So now we're going to start looking. Um, I'm not going to go over this. I'm going to go spend the time on the labs because this is a lot. That basically is talking about what we just did in uh, PyCharm. So we're going to talk about the pseudocode for 3.11. So 3.11 says write a program whose inputs are three integers and whose output is the smallest of the three values. So we do that by testing two of the values at once against the other. So I'm going to, I'm going to have three input statements, and I'm going to take three in three variables, and those, those sorry, three values, those values are assumed to be integer, so make sure you convert them. Now I want to test them to see if, to see what is the smallest. And the easiest way to do that is to use an AND and to test two of the variables against the other. So I'm going to start with first. I'm going to say first is going to be my first test variable. And I'm going to say first is less than or equal to second, and first is less than or equal to third. If both of those are true, first has to be the smallest, so you're going to print out first. If not, you're going to test second. If second is less than or equal to first, and second is less than or equal to third. If both of those are true, then you ha then by definition, second has to be the smallest. Otherwise, third has to be the smallest. You don't even have to test for third at that point. There's no other options. Third has to be the smallest. So this is the pseudocode for the, the, the day of the month um, problem. So basically what we have is they're going to input a day and a, a month. And what they want you to do is they want you to say, what is the season? Is it winter, spring, summer, or fall? Sorry, autumn. But the tricky part is that some of the months aren't in a single Season. Some of the months are split between two seasons. So, for instance, March is split between two seasons, and June is, and September is, and December is. So, this is a very specific order of how you have to work this problem. I have seen people try and make it easier, um, and with given what we know in the class now, it's very difficult to make it a less, to make it a, a, a shorter program. You can do it if you're using data structures, and there are people that have done it using data structures. But we don't get to data structures till week six. So follow this format, and it will make your life easier. Basically what we're doing is we're going to input a month and input a day, and we have to check them. Now first of all, we have to do something that will say invalid if it's not the right day and if it's not the right month. Well, the first, our first check is always going to be month. And what you'll see here is there's all these if-else statements, and some of them have nested ifs. And at the very end, I have this else output invalid, which means if it's not the right month and it's not the right day, then it's invalid. If it is a valid month and it is a valid day, then we have to figure out what season it's in. And for January, it's easy. If, you ha if, if the month is January and the day is greater than zero and the day is less than or equal to 31, you're in winter. 
L if, because we're still checking month. Month is our test variable and day is our test variable. So these are all afterwards going to be L if, except when you get to a nested if. So February is winter if it's between 0 and 29. And don't worry about leap year. 29 is fine here. But let's go take a look at March because March spans two seasons. So this is a different test. This test is month equals March. Let's assume month equal, does equal March. So now we have this nested L if structure. And we have is day greater than or equal to zero and day less than or equal to 19. If both of those are true, then we're still in winter. If day greater than 19 and day less than or equal to 31, then we're in spring. So why in the world would I have an else invalid here? The reason I do that is because Zybooks isn't going to play nice. Okay, Zybooks may put minus one. It may put 293. It can put whatever number it wants there up to the size of a maximum int, which is a really big number. So every time you test that, you have to test to make sure it's invalid. Now, I didn't have to do it for um, January, and I didn't have to do it for February, because I could do everything on a single line with just these ands. But when I get down here and I have to then break up that one long statement into, into one small statement and then another if else branch, I have to make sure that I'm checking for invalid for the day. Now, the other thing you could do if you wanted to is you could check and say, is the month January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, or if, it, if it's not one of these, then it's invalid. And if it's not between 0 and 31, it's invalid. And that would work for most of the month, except for um, February. That wouldn't work for February. And because some months have 31 and some months have 30, you'd have to be uh, pretty careful. So you would still need the greater than 0 and less than or equal to 30. So that's how you roll through this problem. And this is the format you should use. It's very specific. And you can try and deviate. If you want to deviate to make it, e to, and you think you make it easier, um, good luck. I've only seen it really be made easier once or twice, and that was with the use of data structures. OK. We're almost there, I promise. So this is write a, prob <clears throat> write a program with total change amount as an integer input and output the change using the fewest coins, one coin type per line. The coin types are dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. Use singular and plural coin names. So this is a much more expanded version of that floor.py. And yes, that will be up as part of the, um, the scripts. Now, one thing to note with both this and the month, it's really hard to debug in Zybooks. My suggestion to any student is if you're writing these more complex problems, write them in PyCharm. Start out, write them, get them tested, and then put them in Zybooks and see what Zybooks does. If Zybooks has a problem, if they give you some input and your output wasn't right, they can go put that input into PyCharm, run it through the debugger, and see what it comes out at. See where things are getting a little bit broken. So, is that it? That's it. Thank you guys for putting up with me. No problem about the lab. Jump start. These are tough labs. Okay, plus you've got an assignment this week and discussions. So these are just to get you started and get students in the right headspace. Again, we are all learning how to, how to ask a question to a computer. And, and when you start asking complex questions, it gets very difficult. And we're doing this in a single week, so it's a lot. So anybody have any questions? Anybody want to throw up some code and we can walk through it and play with it? Because I think you said, James, you had something you wanted to talk about. 
about the parentheses and the brackets? No problem, Carrie. Okay. Well, James is finding that. Does anybody have any other questions? And it can be about anything to do with the class. If you're curious about your game, if you're curious about um, the labs, things like that, let me know. Okay. Is there a limit to the number? No, there isn't. I, this wasn't C. I was writing a lexicon for a language. And I think I had about 200 ELIF statements in that, in that it was big and it was long. So no, there isn't. Okay, so num1, if num1, okay, you don't need the parentheses. What you do need to do is, imp, is if they're not already, tab those prints. Tab them to the right one. So that's what you need to do, James. But you don't have to worry about the parentheses. PyCharm, Python will get, okay, Python will get the right parentheses, will, will get the right order. The only time you really need parentheses is when you have to control the order of operation for arithmetic stuff, or you really do want to group things. If I had an and, and then later on I had an or, but I only wanted to or two specific things and not the whole thing, I would put that in parentheses, but you don't need parentheses there. Does that work? I thought since we were grouping multiples together, like, because this was the code I wrote for 311. Okay. And so I thought since we were grouping multiples together, but then you also had the and statement in between, we mm -mm. had to group the individuals together that belong together. No. Um, parentheses serve two purposes. They serve order of operation, and they serve as a grouping mechanism. You're not grouping here. This and, you only would group around an and or an or. So if you were saying num1 less than or equal to num2 and num1 whatever or num1 whatever, so you just wanted to use that as an or, then you would want to do parentheses. But you don't need parentheses here. This will work without them. And if you want to, I can put it in PyCharm and we can see. Okay. Okay. <coughs> and by the way, people don't have to stay if they don't want to. Whoops. I found file. Test three. All right. So I'm going to, yeah, it didn't do that. That. And that. Well, right, right off the bat, you cannot have statements after an else. That doesn't work. It's illegal in Python. Else is when all else fails. So there's no question associated with an else. But what you have in the first two is sufficient. Oh, so, sure, Carrie, I'll zoom some more. Sorry about that. OK, I hope that's good. So what you have in the first two is sufficient. You didn't need that else, and it wouldn't work, because if I put it back, you'll see that PyCharm is giving me lots of squiggly red lines. Those squiggly red lines are syntax error. Python will tell you right off the bat. PyCharm will tell you right off the bat it's great at it, and its syntax errors are pretty much always spot on. This actually right here is illegal. You can't do it. Else does not take a statement. ELIF takes a statement, and IF takes a statement. But more importantly, from a logic standpoint, there we go. More importantly, from a logic standpoint, what you have in, on line 5 and on line 
seven are perfect for what you need. So let me take this out. And what I have here is num1 less than or equal to num2 and num1 less than or equal to num3. So let's see how this works. Then we'll take it out, take out the parentheses and see how it works. So I'm going to debug it because I like debuggers. This is test three. I think I called it test three. So I put my breakpoint on line five because I don't need to break for the input statements. So I'm going to start the debugger. I'm going to input one, two, and three. Simple. So I have one, two, and three. So one is less than or equal to two, to num two. That's true. One is less than or equal to three. That's true. So it's going to print num one, and I'm done. So now let me try it in another order. Debug. I'm going to print two. Whoops. What did I do? I must have, I hit the wrong key. Apology. Apologies. Okay. So let's debug it. Okay. So I'm going to do two, one, and three. So now the second one is the smallest number. So two is less than or equal to one. That's false. It's not even going to go to two is less than or equal to three. It doesn't have to. So now I'm down on, L, on elif, num2 is less than or equal to num1, and num2 is less than or equal to num3. Well, 1 is, in fact, less than or equal to 2, and it's going to print 2. And then I'm just going to continue. So now let's run it one more time. And I am going to put in 3. Uh, two and one. So now three is the smallest number. So one is less than or equal to two. That's not true. That's false. So we're going to go right to line seven. Two is less than or equal to one. That's not, that's not correct. I don't even have to test for three. And then I'm going to print three. Now let's do this without these parentheses. Okay, so let's see if I was a liar. I'm now going to do the same set of tests again. I'm going to do one, two, and three. And I'm going to step over, and one, two, and three gives me one on the console. I'm going to do it again. Um, and I did two, one, and three. So, one, sorry, two is not less than or equal to num to one. So now, one is less than or equal to two. I don't have to test three at this point. And my output is, again, one, but it came from line eight. So we're going to do one more time. And now I'm going to do three, two, and one. So. 3 is not less than or equal to 2. 3, sorry, 2 is not less than or equal to 1. And so now I'm going to print out 1 from line 10. So they work the same without the parentheses. And that's because um, you didn't need the parentheses there. Parentheses are for order of assignment. Um, so is that good? So in my original coding, I had if and the two elifs. So I didn't need the second elif either. You didn't have an elif. You had an elf. Unless what you gave me was an else right here. Oops. Okay. This elf. 
that's not an elif, and that else is what had the squiggly lines because this is not this is not legal. It's not legal syntax after an else. So you had an if, an elif, and then an else, which was correct, but it was the statement after the else that was invalid for Python. You can't have it. Gotcha. Else, Thank you. Else. Go ahead. I was just saying I got it now. Thank you. I appreciate Thank it. You. Nope, not a problem. Does anybody have any other questions? Going once, going twice. Everybody have a wonderful evening. I will do my best to get this up tomorrow. So else should have been blank. Else should have just been the way it is here. It's else colon. That's the only thing you do for an else, Carrie. No problem. Again, you guys have a great evening, and I will um, hopefully have this up on the YouTube channel tomorrow with the um, scripts.